All right, everyone's in. May it please the court. Jonathan Walsh for appellant Petrobras America Incorporated. The district court in this case made three critical errors when it dismissed Petrobras's claims under RICO and Texas state law at the motion to dismiss stage. First, the district court did not consider Samson's fraudulent concealment of the bribery scheme at issue. It is undisputed that Samson concealed this scheme from both Petrobras and Pride, which was Petrobras's counterparty for the drilling ship uh, drilling services contract at issue. Samson paid these bribes to ensure that rogue Petrobras officials would approve this agreement with Pride, which was a precondition for a contract between Pride and Samson for the construction of a drill ship later called DS5. And it is undisputed that Samson hid the bribe amounts in a last minute price increase for the drill ship and then lied about it when questioned. This was not Samson's only act of fraudulent concealment. Samson met alone with the rogue officials, Nestor Severo and Renato Duque. Samson concealed the bribe amounts under a secret commission agreement, spreading out the payments to shell entities linked to Severo and Duque over several years. This bribery scheme was so complicated that the Samson executives in Korea asked the Samson employees who were orchestrating it to diagram it. And we've included that triangle diagram in our brief and in the amended complaints. Samson officials wrote in the diagram, the broker fee included in the ship price, parentheses, only final ship price disclosed to Pride. That was an admission that they planned to deceive both Pride and everyone else about this last minute price increase, which was the source of the bribe Samson used to, you, to, bribe, the, to bribe the Petrobras officials. Council, the, the district court seems to have looked to uh, Operation Car Wash. Is that a different uh, scheme altogether than the, than, uh, the DS5 contract? Yes, Your Honor. The district court, this was the second error the district court made. The district court relied on general descriptions of the Operation Car Wash investigation, which was an enormous scandal in Brazil. It pales in, Watergate pales in comparison to the size of this scandal. The, the annual report the district court relied upon, the two newspaper articles that are mentioned in the district court's decision have nothing to do with DS5. They don't mention Petro, they don't mention Pride or DS5. The annual report, which includes a $2.5 billion write-off, doesn't include any amount for DS5. It was only later in October of 2015 when Petrobras received the plea agreements from Brazil, from the Brazilian prosecutors, that, that Petrobras knew about the DS5 bribery scheme. When did, Were the counsel, same when did officials they, when did... involved? I'm sorry, Judge Engelhardt, go ahead. I was gonna ask, so can you pinpoint uh, focus on the time period when your client becomes aware that it's it's uh, Mr. Savaro and Mr. Duque. Uh, first of all, can you pinpoint that date? And also, would that not have been, on that date, whatever it is, would that not have been the time when suspicion arises that maybe other matters they're involved in were also corrupted? Severo and Duque were charged in Operation Car Wash in late 2014. They both denied involvement uh, in, in the bribery scandal. The investigation of those two individuals at that time related to two other drill ships and several other construction projects. There was no connection between the DS5 bribery scheme and Operation Car Wash when Severo and Duque were first charged. In fact, Petrobras counterparty was pride, not Samsung. It's quite different. It's a different relationship, a different contractual relationship than the two drilling drill ship contracts that are mentioned in those newspaper articles. That's why Petrobras does not have any reason to question the DS5 drilling services agreement, which again is a different type of contract. It's a, it's a contract for drilling services, not a contract for the construction of a drill ship. It was only after the audit report that was completed in May, 2015, the report of that audit report to prosecutors, and then finally the, the receipt by Petrobras 
of the plea agreements from the broker involved and from Severo and Duque, where they admitted that they were bribed in connection with DS5. That's the only point where, where Petrobras is aware of, of the DS5 bribery scheme, which is the scheme that is an issue in this case. Not our that date? October 2015. The district court made an error when it assumed that Petrobras knew or should have know, known in October of 2014 when these two newspaper articles came out. Again, the articles do not provide sufficient notice of a bribery scheme involving DS5. There's no mention of pride. There's no mention of the broker who was involved in the DS5 contract. There's no reason at that point to believe, as the district court assumed, that the fraud extended to DS5. Mr. Walsh, are you are you arguing that the district court improperly took judicial notice of any documents, or only that the district court drew improper inferences from those documents? The latter, Judge Willett. We, we don't have an issue with the district court taking judicial notice of the articles. We do have an issue with the inferences that the district court made based on those articles. Again, keep in mind that this was at the motion to dismiss stage. There had been no discovery at this point. Based on the pleadings, the district court should have weighed the inferences in favor of the plaintiff. The district court did the opposite. It, it interpreted these, con these, these newspaper articles, which are outside of the pleadings, in a way that did not support the conclusions the district court reached on constructive notice. Why don't you have a problem with that, with the newspaper articles? You said you don't have a problem with that. We don't have a problem with the fact that the court took judicial notice. It was entitled Why is to that? I don't. Your, Your Honor, the under 201, there, there, there is a, the district court is allowed to take judicial notice. Of newspaper articles? There are cases where that's allowed. But, but our issue is that as a fifth circuit, I'm not aware of any case. I'm, I'm sure my, my opposing counsel will let us know if he's aware of a case, but again, it's, it's, it's not the fact that they took the district court took notice. It's the inferences that the district court made on these articles. There, there was broad discuss, there was broad reporting on operation car wash, but there was no reporting on this bribery scheme. And that's what the district court did wrong. It interpreted these articles, which had to do with different crimes different criminals um, with respect to, to the annual report, at least, and made inferences against our client, inferences that are not supported by those, by those articles. If I can continue, the, the third critical mistake that the district court made was misapplying the accrual rule here, separate accrual rule. Again, the, the notice period for purposes of the statute of limitations begins when the plaintiff is aware of or should be aware of his or her injury. Here, the district court at page six of the decision found that Petrobras knew or should have known of bribery and corruption. The district court did not do the analysis to determine when did Petrobras know or when, did, when should Petrobras should have known that it was injured as a result of this fraudulent contract. Mr. There was Walsh, no such analysis. Is, is the question whether a plaintiff should have known of an injury, is that question ever susceptible to resolution at this early motion to dismiss stage? Rarely, Your Honor. The, the cases we've cited in the briefs and the cases um, regarding uh, this issue typically come up in the summary judgment context. Very few cases are decided at this early pleading stage. Typically, the courts ask, has the plaintiff pleaded himself out of the statute of limitations. And we have not done that. We've, we've pled the opposite. We've pled that we, we were not, Petrobras was not aware of this fraud and should not have been aware of this fraud until it received the actual criminal investigative file regarding the fraud. Based on what was pled, again, which would, should have been viewed in favor of the plaintiff here, there, there is not a sufficient basis to dismiss at this very early stage, the RICO and, and state law claims. Finally, I'll go on to some of the arguments that um, Sampson has made in its brief, uh, which I think the district court disregarded, and I think this court can disregard as well. Sampson has led its brief by arguing that the knowledge of Severo and Duque should be imputed here. We do not think that is appropriate because we have, a, we have adequately alleged the adverse agent doctrine, which finds that if the officials acted solely in their interest, the knowledge of those officials cannot be imputed to the plaintiff. Here, we have alleged that 
Severo and Duque were bribed and benefited by, hundred, by, by millions of dollars only for their own benefit. They were not acting for the benefit of, of Petrobras. In fact, their actions saddled Petrobras with hundreds of millions of dollars of losses for this agreement. The, the imputation document is not appropriate here. Counsel, could you address Love versus National Medical Enterprises? Uh, because to my understanding that you said that Petrobras needed to know who caused the injury, but under that case, you just need to know um, that there is a RICO injury, not who caused it. Well, Love is, is somewhat different than the facts of this case, Your Honor. The, the Love case involved uh, medical fraud. There were allegations that the defendant had overcharged um, Blue Cross Blue Shield. And again, it was a fraudulent concealment case, and the case um, actually ended up not applying the statute of limitations based on that fraudulent concealment. But there, it was much easier to determine who the uh, proper defendant was. It was obviously the, the, the hospital and hospital people that were overcharging for these plaintiffs. That's not the fact pattern here. Here, we have a triangular relationship. Petrobras is directly contracting with Pride, and unbeknownst to Petrobras, Samsung is bribing um, officials at Petrobras to, to approve the separate contract with Pride. There was an arbitration between Pride and Samsung on this issue, and the arbitration tribunal concluded that Pride was not aware of the fraud. So, so here, if Petrobras had sought to bring a claim when the, when the drill ship was first take, taken on standby, it wouldn't have been appropriate to bring the claim against Pride because Pride was not involved in the fraud. Sam, Samson was directly involved in the fraud and Petrobras only became aware of that when it received these plea agreements from Brazil. The other argument that Samson makes in its brief is that Petrobras should have known of the, uh, the injury back when it signed the contract, which is inappropriate again, based on the allegations of the complaint. There were lower level employees at Petrobras who questioned the need for a third drill ship, but these employees worked for Severo. Severo was the head of the division that approved this contract. Based on the analysis that Severo and others were looking at, there was a need for a third drill ship. There were very optimistic assumptions made about the need for drill ships in 2000 and 2008 that ultimately did not come into fruition. There were assumptions based on the blocks that Petrobras had um, obtained through purchase in Angola and other locations outside of, of Brazil, that they would need three drill ships. Based on the information that was available at the time of the contract, there was no reason for Petrobras to believe that the contract had been procured through fraud, which goes back to my first remarks regarding the concealment. The difference between this case and some of the cases that are cited by Samson is that Samson concealed its fraud. It hid the bribe payments from Pride. It hid the, uh, the bribe payments from Petrobras. It created this triangular relationship where, wherein Pride effectively camouflaged any, any role that Samson would have had in the negotiations. There was no reason for Petrobras to believe that this contract, when it was signed in 2008, was the product of fraud. And if it if anyone at Petrobras did know that, anyone other than Severo and Duque, Petrobras certainly wouldn't have entered the contract. Finally, the, Go ahead. if there are any questions, Your Honor, I'm happy to address them now. I don't think so. I was going to ask if you had anything further, but it sounds like you do. So. Well, I just want to make one more comment regarding your question about whether you need to know both who, both the injury and who caused it. I think it's important here uh, to look at why that's an, an important, um, important, I believe, important holding for Motello. It is impossible for Petrobras to bring a claim unless it knows who the proper defendant is. If you look at the ta Texas v. Allen construction case, that's a, 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 a very good example where you need to know who are the people that are actually involved in the RICO activity, who are the, the RICO defendants in order to bring the action. It would be inappropriate for Petrobras to bring the action until it knows that Samson is the source of the bribes. Samson has argued in its brief that, that Petrobras should have brought this action um, based on what it knew before October 2015. There simply was not enough evidence that Samson was involved in this RICO activity for Petrobras to do that. The only counterparty that, that Petrobras believed 
was involved in this drill, drilling uh, services agreement, the only party that they had direct negotiations with was Pride. And again, Pride was not involved in the fraud. Mr. Walsh, quick question that's admittedly kind of peripheral. Um, can you explain to me why you and, and opposing counsel have both uh, both sought to seal so many documents in your briefing in this case? Yes, Your Honor, I'm happy you raised that. Uh, we we <laughs> approached opposing counsel about whether they would seek, seek to seal the documents uh, here in, the, in, in, in this hearing and whether they wanted to have a closed courtroom. We obviously wanted to cite the documents, they're very helpful. Uh, they include the triangular diagram that I mentioned earlier. They include emails where our Samson officials are talking about the, um, the crimes that they are committing that were, not acts, that, that were not accessible to Petrobras. Our view, these are not trade secrets, these are not proprietary information. I think the court correctly found that the court should not be sealed for, should not be closed for this proceeding. Um, it is important for the public to know that Samson was not only involved in the bribery scheme, but that it concealed its bribery scheme from Petrobras and others. Um, so we, we took the position really that these documents were, were not appropriate for, for um, closing the courtroom. However, in an abundance of caution, we made that motion to make sure that we could cite the documents here and here at the uh, oral argument. I thought it was true that both parties independently submitted motions seeking to file their briefs and some supporting documents under seal. Is that true? Well, we, we cooperated with, with Samson's counsel to, to, to do that. There is an NDA in place between uh, Samson and Petrobras that requires us to make best efforts to keep these documents confidential. Um, in, the, in the spirit of that NDA, we, we, we cooperated. But obviously, it's a big difference between filing the documents under seal and not being able to make the arguments to uh, the panel based on the documents. You you have those documents and they're accessible to you. Um, we wanted and to the NDA sure. was simply an agreed stipulated arrangement between the parties. Correct, in connection with the arbitrations that I mentioned earlier. That's how Petrobras received the documents. And the district court sealed them originally as part of the NDA. The so district. Right? I see my time is up, but I'll answer that. Yes, Your Honor, the district court did seal based on the NDA, and the court was closed for the arguments at the motion to dismiss. Okay. Um, I think we have your argument, and you saved time for rebuttal. I did, Your Honor. Thank you. Counsel, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor, and may it please the court. My name is David Wiener. I'm counsel for the Appellee Samsung Heavy Industries. The district court was exactly right in concluding that Petrobras brought its RICO and Texas fraud claims outside the four-year limitations, and that it knew or should have known about its injury, the purported lack of need for DS5, beginning at least in 2014. In a nutshell, by the Why end- Why did it know it into 2014? I, I apologize, Your Honor, I did not hear the beginning of your question. Why, why should- uh... Petrobras have known in 2014? There are essentially a, a couple of pieces of information that Petrobras had before it, no later than 2014. First of all, Your Honor, there's this question of the lack of need for the drill ship. In 2007 and 2008, when DS5 was being negotiated, there were employees inside of Petrobras who questioned the need for DS5 and said, we don't think it's necessary because we have these two other drill ships. In 2011, they receive DS5 and it becomes operational. At that time, Your Honor, they have essentially nothing to do with DS5. They have no need for it. This but is isn't, aren't there other reasons, reasons commercial reasons why that States might have been the case? Court. I think there's some reference to Good afternoon. Uh, deep water um, horizon and thank things you for going attending on in the market at the time. Why would hearing? that be a I'm very sorry. Light? that we weren't able to accommodate it's, it's you in New Orleans this week. As it turns notice, out, Honor, one panel put together of our these, court these is having some arguments, but when you buy um, a more than since you were the only panel on which both attorneys 
and signaled you your it, willingness you have to show up, to do with it. we didn't it think it made sense for us to all to troop questions. down there for that But, purpose. Your Honor, there's more than but that things still. are going to change so this, pretty soon, this I think. massive contract so that you have paid something. for, that you have nothing um, to do with it. We so do have, have a couple of adjustments or times over the uh, ensuing years. extra rules then of the road for purposes of Zoom in, hearings. One uh, is we ask you to silence any other devices Petrobras you have files or those of people in the room SEC. with you. Uh, the second one is October that we 2014, still do the audio recordings that as a result of the, of the operation sitting, car but we wash will not, we do, we, that this as scheme, in New Orleans, you're not allowed video or audio event for yourselves. Uh, um, class, if you like, businesses, we will give you five uh, minutes uninterrupted Brazilian time at the beginning of your presentation. That Petrobras is just because tied there's always a little bit of a gap wash. in communication and here. Contractors and, and then suppliers to uh, Petrobras the other thing I would say is we will appreciate in that and your cases to record more, citations. More than two and a half billion um, dollars. We have a time and clock system. The yellow light will tell you that you have two minutes left and when the red light signals, we ask you to conclude unless you're answering a question is involved the, the in this sole scheme. case this afternoon Duke, is number okay. 22416 title was the Holly chief Flo versus special also was RTP, in the drillship process and we'll hear from so Mrs. now they Stratton know again. that thank you judge jones and may it please the court for drill ships. The party's it's contract says that any scheme. action they arising out of the agreement must be arbitrated. Years, In this action, Cauliflow alleges that appellees breached the but agreement, still more, giving right? rise to various because contract and tort year, claims. But the district court denied Cauliflow's arbitration arrested. request. Not just this court should reverse for two wash. reasons. He's not just First, in because the parties undisputedly have an arbitration agreement, the law heavily presumes that Polyfo's action is but arbitrary. It's also known to deny arbitration, is this court must have positive assurance that the arbitration SHI. agreement cannot why, be read to cover this action. There is at least no such positive assurance here. Why does Second, that, that not appellee's merits defenses and point, procedural arbitrability challenge so are for the for arbitrator to decide reasons, Honor, and uh, thus may the not first preclude arbitration. Is, I think as Judge Rosenthal to begin, decision, the scope of the arbitration agreement here time, is reasonably construed Petrobras to cover this entire action. The settlement agreement requires arbitration with, of any uh, action with, that arises with, out uh, of the agreement. The, Cerbero, the plain meaning of action is lawsuit, the entire civil proceeding. So the Parties agree to arbitrate, well, arbitrate the entire civil proceeding if it arises out of the settlement see, agreement. Not many. And there's this one lawsuit other qualifies. One, DS5. First, and they look and they this lawsuit exists because of the settlement no agreement. In the first page of Polyflow's complaint was delivered. at 1189 fact, of the record on appeal makes that clear, stating Petrobras that Polyflow is bringing this action because the parties entered a settlement agreement, but appellees have not complied with it and never intended to comply. The, the Second, this lawsuit includes claims that appellees concede arise out of the agreement, the specifically Polyflow's claim and appellee's counterclaim for, it for has breach of the agreement. Million dollars so because this action unequivocally includes claims that arise out of the settlement agreement, and indeed the lawsuit only market, exists because uh, there is rates. a settlement agreement that we they allege has been breached, the action arises out of the agreement. Connection with and the plain DS5 language of the arbitration clause the thus requires arbitration of the entire lawsuit. For the first two drill this court employed that reason reasoning in, in its 2019 decision in Archer, Cerbero which we cited there, to the court as supplemental the authority. That, the Archer um, panel uh, focused on the plain the meaning of the term action, and is, and which and meant the entire involved, lawsuit, in not just DS5 individually scheme. qualifying claims. Also and it refused and to rewrite the arbitration Padilla. agreement there the other to encompass only individually qualifying claims. How is this in the And I think it's important to note that the reasoning that Archer used applies with even more force in this um, case, because there, Archer involved an exclusion from arbitration. 
And they so actually the plain meaning of action, the exclusionary language, the had to be enough itself. to overcome so a presumption in favor of arbitration. All of this Here, into the plain meaning of any action governs what is not included in arbitration. So in this case, okay. so the, the contract's the plain SEC language filing, and the presumption in, in favor of arbitration uh, so that, are rowing in the same direction. Now, sorry, I was... Appellees have I contended question, that the apologize. settlement agreement the deviates the from the plain complaint. meaning of action Your and Honor, specially defines action to more narrowly mean only claim. But, it was a document but the that contract does not support of, that argument. And, um, you can uh, see the settlement agreement at tab four that. of our record um, excerpts. The question, and if Your you look Honor, in subsection A on the very first page, you'll see that the settlement agreement does not define the term action. So under ordinary contract interpretation principles, the plain language language of the term court should govern to lawsuit, entire civil proceedings. What the settlement agreement does define at A1 four, is the term four, claim, uh, and, the and it defines nine. it because it's going uh, to use that documents. term to describe what is being released by the parties Sorry, in this settlement agreement what and were those documents in So it case? defines in claim case, expansively I think they were to include articles. not only claims, but okay. also demands, but the, uh, actions, causes of action, so on and so forth. We're only supposed All to that take this means, however, is that when the settlement agreement uses the word claim, it means to incorporate a more expansive meaning. Are we it does not that mean that when the settlement agreement uses the word action, as it does in this arbitration agreement, that the no, parties intended to, to more narrowly constrict the plain meaning of that term like to mean that. only claim. Why isn't and in fact, your honors, not the case uh, A1 before. of the settlement agreement Honor, that defines claims shows the parties Morris, understood um, there is a difference a between the word action and the word claim because they define claims to include claims, actions, and, and causes of action, showing that they articles. understand the difference. So I, I don't know specifically so about judicial we contend, notice, but there are with the support of Archer and other authorities that this any action clause is unambiguous and the entire lawsuit must be arbitrated. But that is at least a reasonable interpretation interpretation known pieces of, of the arbitration agreement. And, that and so in that case, the standard for denying arbitration is not met because this court can have no positive assurance that this agreement is incapable of being read to cover um, this action. In, in fact, in abacus versus that be Black, in summary judgment, not in I'd like to turn now, unless the court has questions the about the scope stages. of the arbitration clause, to appellees asserted defenses. Let me ask you one question. When you say arbitration clause, um, the settlement agreement has two paragraphs discussing arbitration. Are you referring to B5C or C4, or how are we supposed to interpret those positions together? But C4 when you're is the, about the clause that I'm referring to. Piece of information and Polyfus's that position case, is that, Petrobras based on the text and context of the settlement agreement, that C4 was is the arbitration the clause. B5C is, um, a, is essentially belt and suspenders. It's additional language that also underscores the broad intent of the parties um, to arbitrate court, a broad range cited, of disputes. And so when I'm referring to the arbitration agreement, I'm referring to C4. But B5C, as we've argued in our brief, is further support for the argument the that there's no positive assurance that the parties agreed to exclude any of the claims in this grounds. action. And the, the reasons that the court found that okay, the statute thanks. of limitations had run. I'll turn now to defenses. The defendants in that case, this court should hold that the issues of release, had been prior material breach, and lack of mediation from are for the arbitrator accounts, to decide. Not belonging to the plaintiff. This court's inquiry, this when court faced with a request for arbitration, is, is very limited. That into the court does not address the merits, the, the but asks only whether an arbitration accrued. agreement exists that and whether the subject matter the of the dispute is within that, its scope. Um, that the plaintiff Where the in that existence case of the contract is at not at issue, as here, and the only defenses a court so may consider are those that no specifically relate to the making of the arbitration agreement Judge itself. Rosenthal took defenses that apply to the continuing enforcement of the contract as a whole are for the arbitrator to decide as part of the merits of the underlying employee, dispute. Uh, this court has held that repeatedly in Primerica, in Bank One, in Will Drill, and the Supreme Court has held the same in Prima Paint. 
their argument here, uh, Apelli's defense is that PolyFlow uh, has sued on released claims what or that PolyFlow has committed a prior material breach of the settlement agreement by firing the neutral pipe expert. The These are not independent attacks that solely that relate to the arbitration agreement, but they are merits defenses to, that go to uh, the, the enforcement of, of the contract more generally. Even if and Apelli's answer illustrates that. Their answer in the district court, which this court can find at Record on Appeal 1324 to 1325, and, and I direct the court specifically to paragraphs three and fifteen to go through make it clear the that they have pled both release Your Honor, and prior material breach as affirmative defenses to polyflow's claims on the merits, as so well as Honor, using both release and, and prior Texas material Supreme breach in the form of allegedly uh, firing the neutral pipe expert as a basis for their the counterclaim the, for breach of contract. So it's clear from their answer that these issues, release and prior material breach, these are merit issues for the arbitrator and not defenses not to the making of the arbitration agreement for the court. smoking gun paper, Ms. Stratton, uh, so let me we don't know whether it is or not, frankly. That could minute. be summary judgment um, evidence. There, you know, um, let's so assume there's a textual argument in the arbitration clauses just for looking the at the file. So how does that your, work? Complaint well, again, Your Honor, I think this court, as I said, your, has not, uh, has not considered that there is any sort of grace period basis. when you have access one of to those the information. Is, uh, and I think the best example of that is, again, one of the cases we cited, how do you, Martinez Tapia how do you square uh, versus that Chase Manhattan with, Bank. And that uh, was I'm not talking about a grace contract. period. I'm talking about also, when is it reasonable what about to discover? The is it that very day? Claim? How does not? that arise well, so out of I think the, the teaching of that case, agreement. Your Honor, is that when it's So when I'll it's turn first to the fraudulent in inducement possession, claim. It arises out of the settlement agreement for the following reasons. First, okay. under Texas law, a fraudulent inducement claim cannot exist the, uh, but for the fraudulently induced contract, and it requires the existence of that contract as part of its raise that as an alternative our ground, claim is even more uh, dependent upon the contract because Rosenfeld in paragraph 80 of our complaint we allege that decision. it is misrepresentation um, the in the settlement agreement ask, itself that fraudulently induced us to enter the contract that, and I'd also direct defense. the court's attention to the following decisions, the Prima Paint, yes. Henry the Kaplan from the Texas record? Supreme Court, I mean, that really Burwell from a Texas appellate court, Sweet Dreams from uh, the Seventh so Circuit, Honor, as well as this, this court's, court's own decision in Marlin, really which involved the, broad and narrow the, arbitration the response, clauses. And, this, I mean, so and the court's as held in all of those matter, cases that fraudulent inducement claims were arbitral, um, whether the um, their clause was broad is, or narrow. Imputed to the company unless As for the tortious the interference doc, claim, Your Honor, doctrine applies, these claims are specifically predicated that. on so misrepresentations and omissions that. that we allege There's, appellees made no to evidence. third parties I mean, about the settlement agreement was... itself. These are noticed. these misrepresentations and omissions are pled at paragraphs again, Your Honor, 64 the court and 68 that. That, of and our that, complaint, and, and, Judge Rosenthal and they are incorporated by reference into our causes um, so of action at paragraph 70. To address um, that and you'll also find them the incorporated by reference into the tortious interference you claim at paragraph that, 117. Agree that that's not a and so we allege that the breaches of duties I mean, imposed by the settlement agreement, the use of our information, in the, complaint and in the, um, the misrepresentation about our relationship um, is what caused tortious interference with business relationships. And this court has made clear in numerous cases, as have Texas courts, that a breach of contract can involve tortious conduct that gives rise to both breach of contract and challenge that at the same future time. proceedings. And that's what's happened and so I here. It's on why the basis our tortious interference claim arises out of, of this contract because along it is generated by Apelli's alleged complaint, breaches. Then I think contract. we absolutely do satisfy the test for imputation. Do you have any um, um, uh, idea why uh, Judge Hoyt disposed of this argument, in though, one is sentence? I, and I'm had more looking than at the document to see if there was no oral hearing. That they had been injured. On their the argument in the district agreement. court so, was not that they needed to I, I, I know, know about any um, fraud. That's quite a mystery to us as well, to know about um, particularly given the strong presumption their in favor of arbitration the and the broad language here under numerous court precedents. Um, so his summary summary denial of arbitration no um, is, is quite a mystery no to us, and it's why we're here. Um, I don't know the answer, unfortunately, Judge. only reached that conclusion. I would like to turn and discuss failure of mediation now. In 2015. Mediation is a question of procedural arbitrability, based on their and procedural arbitrability is a question for the arbitrator in, the in nearly all circumstances. Context. 
this Nor court has, has found that there's only one rare exception in which the court can decide a procedural prerequisite as bars arbitration, as they and that is when it is clearly established that a procedural requirement is a condition precedent to arbitration and, so and has been breached such that no rational mind could conclude otherwise. Their first contract that high bar somebody, for this, taking this, this question of whether mediation is a procedural bar to arbitration would has not been from, you would think they would that ask about from the arbitrator what happened has not been met in this case around DS5 because a rational mind could agree with Polypho and that no mediation is it. not a condition or precedent over the ensuing or years. that if and it is, instead, it's been either deemed fulfilled or excused and by appellee's conduct really frustrating mediation. Is that a RICO and, and before I tick through those reasons very briefly, I'd like to remind the court want the that under general warehousemen and other precedents, this when court doesn't need to agree to that Polypho would prevail on any of these points. It need only conclude that a rational mind could agree and that these issues are not clearly established such that it's the arbitrator's problem. Supreme to decide um, whether mediation is a bar. At all. To the contrary, mediation is not a bar and not a condition of precedent its because it's disfavored under Texas law. Has and I note that at brief pa uh, page 30 of, of their brief, appellees have reversed course in their position in the district and court and they've argued to this court whether or not that mediation is in fact injury. not a condition precedent. That seems at least suggestive that a rational mind could agree with And whether or not you need to know the settlement agreement's mediation terms only apply to issues of B1 and B2 compliance. Supreme Court's decision um, they don't apply to the other that. types of this issues that are in dispute here. Don't support that. And even as to B1 and B2, they only apply when the pipe expert has made a determination a that the them. appellees are the out of circuit, compliance, uh, the which Alvarez appellees decision, concede never happened the here. Circuit, in, but even uh, if it is a condition precedent, case, it's been deemed fulfilled by their failure to specifically deny no it in their answer. But even most, more importantly, the who it's been frustrated in, in by appellees withholding of their design and manufacturing this, process the information, doesn't mean that you which is the earlier step necessary to even get to date. mediation. And this All court has held that a promissor cannot take advantage of a condition, a failure of a condition that they themselves frustrated. And I see my time is ending, so I will reserve the remaining time for you have to investigate. Thank you, ma'am. And if you have, have uh, we'll a pain, hear from Mr. if you Schla have an injury that Schla you discover, then it's your responsibility to bring suit within the You're limitations muted. period. There you go. Um, so I think Thank the, you, the notion and uh, the argument may please that the court. Uh, know my name is Steve sue, Slather and I represent that, that the does not stop the accrual uh, from I, I think a, a brief the background here will be helpful to determine uh, understand kind of the context of the settlement agreement. And here, Mr. Wright, Petrobras was one of the uh, defendants in Appalachia, is that their uh, injury was the developer was of the, the technology that that's kind of at the, no the center of this. Uh, he that founded Polyflow. He was its CEO for a time, could have developed its products during that time. And allowing them to pick at some point, the, the parties went their separate the ways. Mr. Wright when they set out the to form Specialty RTP, uh, where he remains audit, today, this and Polyflow continued with this business. Cases uh, and the Texas Supreme you, Court you've seen reference and we've we discussed it in our brief head. that for uh, reasons, in 2015 Polyflow no Poly 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 brought as we, as claims we, as we against Mr. Wright, Wright and exactly right, SRTP and, and in fact those those claims are largely the same claims they bring now in this case. to do so and the limitations period on its claims has run. That suit was ultimately resolved it was it was Mr. Walsh, uh, you've said really best described as a nuisance suit. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and that's Just evidenced by the fact that injury. if you, if you look at the settlement agreement, no money changed hands there. When a uh, the, the, um, the part of that agreement is, injury. is sections B1 on and B2, and those put restrictions the on of RICO, uh, the claim specialty is based RTP on with regard to what information RICO. it can use and what products it could design or manufacture. Based on what was in a Mr. Wright and SRTP Never files did show that there information, was some question about whether the agreement provided that there was, was a needed. mechanism that was as of for Polyflow to confirm on an ongoing basis whether, said whether the, the, the uh, any of uh, SRTP's products put on, did put on include Polyflow information. It only later was assigned twice 
when the work the slowed RTP down. And Judge Engelhardt mentioned some of the reasons. Uh, dispute resolution issues framework that set forth could have been the factors for such a slowdown. B4 there was a moratorium in the Gulf agreement. of Mexico. And, due and to what the those call for uh, is the incident, appointment by an arbitrator in the, in the, in the of what's referred to as a, of an oil RTP oil expert or a neutral pipe expert. After 2008, and that was a, a report, which person that was neutral and also knowledgeable about the technology and the product that were involved it identifies uh, from both polyflow and SRTP. Over the and of and years that framework was in requires that the, the order, pipe expert uh, uh, examine any products that, uh, was that the RTP intended to manufacture or design for a time uh, period and, and make Shavara a determination and of whether those no, Your Honor, as head of the International Division, B1 several would have been responsible the for many different agreement. drill ships in many different and areas. And the reason this framework uh, was set up this way and the reason that, that, that there was the a time, neutral expert put a in place different was because had over 203 RTP drill was particularly ships concerned that polyflow so again used, our focus was when uh, the drill ship went on standby to, the reasons it went on standby as our set to discover or learn about was based on the rtp's technology oil industry slowdown. and so that's why they had the this investigation mutual expert into, in between um, so that this drill ship neither and the other drill ships in the auto report uh, was based on commercial would ever be shared and with the other uh, it would all Weinstein go to the neutral expert who would make a decision agreement and we don't disagree with that the but information would remain in, a RICO claim. Uh, separate. We could from not have brought, party. Dr. Ross could not have brought uh, a RICO claim against Pride based on forward, a commercially terrible um, contract. The it was pipe only expert, when once he made Petrobras a decision, and as, as Ms. Stratton noted, uh, if the decision was, was in favor of specialty RTP, not a commercially terrible one, the a fraudulently pipe procured uh, decision contract. was final. Only if I want to go back to the newspaper uh, point, Judge Elrod, the RTP that you was in violation. The case that council mentioned Adam would it then trigger uh, a mediation process, and the pipe expert would attempt to mediate that dispute. Notice. In that case, Judge and Rosenthal, only if he was unsuccessful judge, in mediating that dispute, judgment, would the party the, the parties then agree about the to oil take food program that dispute were not sufficiently to arbitration. Detailed. And that is the, the could know that they had a claim the arbitration provision that you see Similarly in here, Section no B5 of the agreement. They were charged. And it is specifically the related to is these up, disputes uh, that, are, you, that may arise the court in the context the of the neutral decision. pipe expert and Sections B1 and B2 of the agreement. Today, and we but appreciate you appearing the, virtually the important part so of that is that this argument the purpose was and, to prevent um, uh, specialty RTP's technology yes. from falling into polyflow's hands under the guise of policing the agreement. The, the second arbitration clause here is uh, found in Section C4. It, it relates only to uh, disputes that arise under the agreement. And that's very clear. The court, and, and, and I think uh, on, on that point, uh, the, the courts are clear, including in the Pennzoil case, that an arbitration clause that uses language such as arising out of uh, is a narrow clause. And, and, and the court in Pennzoil contracted that with broad clauses that use language such as arising out of or related to. That's clearly not what we have here uh, under Pennzoil. The clause in C4 is a narrow one. Uh, that, that's further evidenced by the fact that, that, that the clause in C4 does not even cover all disputes that would arise under this agreement because it's uh, as I mentioned, the, the, the separate dispute resolution mechanism set forth in, in Section B5 would cover disputes that fall under Sections B1 or B2 of the agreement. Well, I might agree with you if the uh, arbitration provision in, B, in uh, B5C said anything about limited to this agreement or this mechanism, but uh, it's instead it says for purposes of clarity the parties are agreeing that any disputes arising out of or related to this agreement will be arbitrated. And uh, is aren't we since since and going a little further, um, aren't we required to interpret these provisions harmoniously and not? Uh, one limiting the other or being limited arbitrarily uh, as opposed to the other one. 
Go ahead. Well, I, I think they do need to be uh, interpreted harmoniously. I'm sorry, Your Honor. I, th I think they do need to be interpreted uh, harmoniously. And I think the way that, uh, that that is done in this case is that you look at uh, you, you look at the agreement as a whole, and specifically in sections uh, B4 and B5, it sets forth uh, this dispute resolution framework that relates to the, uh, as I mentioned, the neutral pipe expert and, and his duties to resolve uh, disputes arising under sections B1 and B2. Uh, and then if you look, C4 then would cover anything else and and so uh, otherwise you you would the, the the if you read section b5c broadly to cover uh all disputes that arise under or relate to the agreement uh you end up rendering c uh, the the uh, clause in c4 a nullity and that's uh, what 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 the parties intended here was that that agreement and uh, or that clause in b5 would relate to uh the dispute resolution framework of sections B1 and B2, and that C4 then would cover any other disputes that arise under the agreement. Well, so with regard to what's your best uh, case, what's your best case with regard to? Yeah, you're, uh, you and I, the, your transmission is a little slow. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. I apologize, and, and and I don't. It it does drop occasionally, and I'm not sure why. Um, well, but but um, I I think just the the plain reading of of the uh, agreement, uh, as you mentioned, requires uh, those two clauses to be harmonized, and uh, the the agreement itself makes clear how to do that. Uh, because it sets forth uh, it sets forth the framework for dispute resolution under uh, B B uh, one and B two in sections B four and B five. Uh, as as I mentioned, um, where you have uh, two competing clauses, and in this case they don't compete. Um, but but if 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 you did try to read them on top of each other, one would be just be rendered a nullity, and that. Uh, that shouldn't be the right uh, result here. Further, uh, I, I believe I, I understood Polyflow to say that that they are uh, they are they are uh, seeking arbitration solely under C four in this case. Uh, with regard to the argument that all claims. Uh, if, if any claim is arbitrable, all claims are, arg are arbitrable, and that's uh, that's Polyflow's argument with the Archer case. Um, here again, the agreement makes clear that certain disputes, those arising under B1 and B2, uh, do not fall under the arbitration clause in C4. And so at least uh, one uh, category of claims would not uh, go to arbitration, even under that, or, or should or should not go to arbitration under Section C4. That's not what the parties agreed to. They they agreed to have two separate uh, arbitration provisions uh, covering different aspects of the agreement. So and is so, so is it your position that you want part of this uh, dispute arbitrated and part of it submitted to the federal court? Well, we, we believe all, all the claims are proper, should properly remain in, in front of the court and that none of them are arbitrable. And uh, Well, you just said that B1 and B2 are arbitrable. It, they, they are if, and, and, and that goes to whether certain conditions are met. And, and as we describe in our, in our briefing, those conditions just simply haven't been met. Um, there's, there's a framework and uh, it requires uh, the the appointment of an MPE by an arbitrator, that was done. And it requires the uh, pipe expert to then examine uh, SRTP products to see if they uh, are in violation of sections B1 or B2. He's done that. 
uh, in this case, he's, he has not found a violation. And, and therefore, under the, under the terms of the agreement, that's, that's the end of that inquiry. Uh, however, if, if there was a case where he found SRTP to be in violation, only then, if he was not able to mediate that dispute, would that specific dispute go uh, to arbitration under the provision in Section B-5? Well, I mean, they assert that a number of their claims... So, uh, they assert in, in that way, then... Okay, I'll try again. They assert that a number of their claims are based on uh, uh, disclosures of information contrary by specialty RTP, uh, contrary to the settlement agreement, interference with uh, customers of uh, Polyflow and um, uh, Lanham Act violations, uh, and it seems to me all of those are reasonably read as being governed by the settlement agreement. So why are they not arbitrable under C four? Well, if, if if we look at the at the Ford case, for example, the the test for whether tort claims arise or relate to the uh, relate to the agreement is, is whether those claims could stand alone. And so certainly the Lanham Act claims, um, which which relate to trademark trade dress uh, largely, those claims could certainly stand alone here. The, the, the existence of the agreement is, is not required to go forward with those claims. Um, with regard to tortious interference, uh, th this it's the same. The uh, the activities that Polyflow complains about was which was disclosing information to uh, certain customers, uh, setting aside that 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 may not even fall under the Lanham Act because it doesn't relate to goods or services. Um, that that cause of action would stand alone. It does not require the existence of the contract and this the same is true with regard to the fraudulent inducement claims and that's uh, if, if, if we look at the ford clay case it addressed uh fraudulent inducement lanham act claims and tortious interference claims and in each of those instances it found that uh, they did not relate to the underlying agreement and did not require the agreement uh and in that in that way they they stood alone and were not arbitrable. And and I will point out in that case that was that was a broad uh, that did involve a broad arbitration uh, provision that uh, covered any claims arising from or related to uh, the agreement, which is is not what we have here. We have a narrow uh, provision that only covers claims that arise from the agreement. And so, with regard to Lanham Act fraudulent inducement, tortious interference, uh, they simply just don't. Uh, arise from the agreement they they stand alone under ford why is it that your client decided not to do arbitration polyflow has asserted in this case uh, a, a number of claims that were that it previously released in the earlier case uh, and and we've provided a, a comparison of those claims and you'll see that they are, uh, most of them are largely identical. And in fact, um, it, in, in the uh, first amended complaint, Polyflow makes clear that it's relying on activity that occurred before the settlement agreement. And that's it at uh, record uh, 1203 and 1204, um, where it sets out, it specifically sets out before the settlement agreement and then provides a kind of laundry list of, of uh, bad acts that it claims SRTP is guilty of. And for, further in the counts themselves, it refers to uh, activity involving Exxon, the drones, both of those companies uh, were part of the uh, 2015 loss. And so, uh, we, we, we don't want to case and 
uh, we think they should use. They, they, they should be resolved uh, in federal court, not in front of an arbitrator. They, they simply do, do not arise out of this agreement. I mean, if we look at what the parties agreed to arbitrate, and, and that's really the, the focus here, uh, what, what did the parties agree to arbitrate? It, it's very clear. They agreed to arbitrate only those disputes that arise out of the agreement. And that's and so, it. And the word is action. Uh, the word is action. And in this case, um, we uh, contend that that action means a, a claim or a cause of action. And we have addressed the Archer case uh, in, in, in our response to Polyflow's uh, supplemental authority. But, and that's further underscored um, by the party's definition of, of a claim in this case, where it, it uh, defines claim synonymous with action, uh, where the parties wanted to refer to an entire uh, litigation. They, they did so, for instance, they referred to the 2015 litigation um, or they refer to it as a civil action. Uh, in this case, action uh, should be construed to mean cause of action. And that's further underscored by the fact that uh, to, to read action as the entire action in, in C4 would then render any claims that arise under B1 and are required to be arbitrated, perhaps at some point under section B5, it would, re it would render that a nullity and that, that shouldn't be uh, the result here. The, going back to uh, two issues, with, with regard to the release claims, I understood uh, Polyflow to argue that that is an issue for the arbitrator. Uh, it's simply not. In this case, those claims, uh, the released claims that, that are now included in uh, Polyflow's current uh, complaint were released in the same agreement that, uh, that the arbitration clauses are found. And so it, it, that is not, uh, those claims are not something that the parties agreed to mediate. It, it perhaps could be a different result if they were, if, if the release claims were in a different uh, agreement or something along those lines, but here they were released in the very same agreement. So it, it, it makes no sense that the parties would have agreed to release those claims, but still agree to arbitrate them at some point in the future. Um, with regard to the the uh, failure to mediate, the the framework in section B is very clear that it, that if, if Polyflow believes that SRTP is in violation, it can raise that issue with the neutral pipe expert, and then he will. Uh, go forward with his analysis and mediation if necessary to resolve the dispute. Um, SRTP has compl complied with, with every request from the uh, pipe expert with regard to providing products. Uh, so for, for examination, products and information. So to the extent that, that Polyflow claims that there are products that uh, it believes are in violation, but uh, SRTP is not turned over, the, the re, that is the result of Polyflow not raising that issue with the neutral pipe expert in the first instance. And I see I am out of time. Yes, Thank sir, you. you're out of time. Uh, we'll go back to Ms. Stratton for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to begin with the issue of mediation. You've heard opposing counsel describe their view of why mediation was a prerequisite here. And we obviously vehemently dispute that. And that's precisely why the issue is not clearly established such that this court 
could decide it because no rational mind could do anything but agree with Mr. Schlafer's position. He's not articulated why it is clearly established and essentially undisputed here that a procedural prerequisite was breached. So all of his arguments about what should have been done in the mediation process, that's all for the arbitrator to decide under this court's procedural arbitrability precedents. I'd like to also briefly discuss the issue of release. Appellees appear to be trying to take the issue of release and frame it as a question of what the parties agreed to arbitrate, a question of substantive arbitrability. But this court has made clear that it does not consider the merit in its substantive arbitrability determination. You said that in Chevron Chemical, you said it in Bank One v. Hill and in numerous other cases. And what Mr. Schlather's argument does by asserting release as a question of the scope of the arbitration agreement is inject the merits into the substantive arbitrability determination. For this court to decide whether polyflow release or sued on released claims, it would have to resolve the merit. That's, that is a basis for polyflow's counterclaim in this case. That's not properly before the court in a substantive arbitrability analysis. Release is a defense. That's how this court should treat it. And that's exactly how um, Mr. Schlather's answer on behalf of specialty RTP in the district court treated it as an affirmative defense on the merits, a basis for their merits counterclaim, and therefore it's properly submitted to the arbitrator as part of the underlying merits of the dispute. Now, I'd like to move on to addressing the interaction between C4 and B5. There is a way to harmonize these provisions, to read them quite naturally in a way that doesn't treat them as two separate arbitration provisions or treat them as um, a limitation on one another. First, there is nothing in the text of either C4 or B5C that suggests that they apply to anything other than the entirety of the agreement. There is no limiting language as Judge Jones noted. And the most natural reading we submit of B5 is that it is inserted to protect the breadth of the party's arbitration agreement because it appears in a section laying out certain procedures for uh, resolving certain types of disputes under the agreement. And it heads off the potential argument that by laying out those procedures, these were the only substantive claims the parties intended to arbitrate. And so the text of B5 says very clearly, for purposes of clarity, we are clarifying that we are agreeing that any dispute arising out of or related to this agreement shall be arbitrated. And so in C4, you have an extraordinarily broad arbitration provision. In B5C, you have another extraordinarily broad arbitration provision and broad plus broad equals broad. It does not, as Mr. Schlather contends, equal narrow. And it does not equal a rising under, which is what he said at the beginning of the argument that we agreed in C4 to arbitrate a rising under. Um, this court made clear in Explo that a rising out of and a rising under are not the same. And that a rising out of is a broader arbitration clause than the more narrow a rising under. It's Mr. Schlather's burden to furnish this court with positive assurance that these arbitration, this arbitration agreement cannot be read to cover this action. And to, in order to meet that burden, appellees have had to rewrite the arbitration language to a rising under and call arbitration clauses that this court and others have repeatedly called broad, narrow, insisting upon that. And, and, and our opinion, your honors, is that that doesn't amount to positive assurance um, that these claims are not arbitrable. I'd also like to briefly distinguish Ford, which Mr. Schlather relies upon. In Ford, the court made it clear that when a tort claim is based upon a breach of contract, it's arbitrable. There, there was no breach of contract claim in the case. The, the, the parties could have completely complied with their obligations under the contract and the tort claim in that case would still have proceeded. That's why the Ford court was able to say, this contract is legally irrelevant to this tort claim. We can treat it like it doesn't exist. That's not possible here. For example, Mr. Schlather asserts that the Lanham Act claims have nothing to do with the settlement agreement, but I'd refer the court to paragraphs 96 and 114 of our unfair competition claims, which are based specifically upon uh, appellee's misrepresentations about the terms and scope of the settlement agreement itself. The fact finder simply could not resolve those claims without consulting the terms and scope of the settlement agreement and they arise under out of the contract. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. That concludes our uh, brief uh, hearing for today and we'll take the case under advisement. Thank you.